there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate Star Wars through music and sound, five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chris Anthony Tan, and today's episode is based on minutes 76 through 80 of Star Wars Episode 8, The Last Jedi. In these set of minutes, Rey continues her dark explorations in the mirror cave, Kylo Ren lends a sympathetic ear, they touch fingertips via the Force, and it ends with Rey trying to convince a resistant Luke that it's worth saving Kylo Ren. I'm a little bit nervous about doing this episode because it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting topic. It's a pretty big topic, and I'm really just going to be adding my voice to debate that not debate, but like discussion, discourse that's been going on for a long time and that other film analyzers and critics and fans um, have a lot to say about. So I'll be adding a music perspective today. Um, basically, what I'm getting at is there are obvious parallels between Ray's mirror cave scene in The Last Jedi and Luke's cave scene on Dagobah in The Empire Strikes Back. So today I thought it would be fun to take a listen, take a look, um, break down a little bit of the music in each of those scenes and see what similarities and what differences we can find and you know what we c might interpret from that or just things that we can notice about them moving forward that might inform our overall perspective on how we compare those two things. I have a lot of musical examples and I have audio stuff that I will be playing. So yes, I will be filing a uh, copyright claim dispute right after I post this episode because fair use. Um, but also I have my piano and violin so I can uh, demonstrate things, little techniques that I'm going to end up uh, discussing because there's a lot of string techniques and other things like that that I will for sure demonstrate and try to explain things as best as I can. I will probably throw out a few more terms than and I won't go into detail explaining each of them. I will go into detail explaining the ones that I think are important, but the extra stuff that I sprinkle in there, consider that like, you know, that's uh, for the listeners who know what it is. It's just like a little extra. So yeah, I'll try to make it clear by demonstrating like the ones that I think are more salient. Okay. All right. I think, I think I'm ready. Okay. Let's do this. Nervous. Like I said, I'm nervous. All right. So in Empire Strikes Back, Luke's cave scene happens at around the one hour mark. If you want to go back and check that out. And in The Last Jedi, Rey starts slipping into her cave scene around the one hour and 15 mark. So if you want to ever go back and compare them, I highly recommend it because it actually is quite it's quite interesting. The soundtracks only tell half the story. Um, that's a, you know, there's obviously so much sound design that's missing from just listening to the soundtracks. And also uh, the moments where things are cut in the film to give more space and, um, and things like that. Before I start throwing around terms and comparisons, how about we do a little refresher on what each of these tracks sound like? So I'm going to play a little clip from The Magic Tree from The Empire Strikes Back. That is the track title first. And then I'm going to play a little bit from The Cave from The Last Jedi. So here's The Magic Tree, and this is from Empire Strikes Back. All right, fade you out. And now I'm going to play a little bit from the cave.
All right. Obviously, um, I can't hear you <laughs> while you're listening, but think to yourself, vibe-wise, how do you feel about those two things? Vibes pretty similar, very different. What sort of moods are you picking up on? I'll give you a minute, not a minute, five seconds. And I'll share what I think or what I feel. They both feel atmospheric, uh, a little bit scary, a little bit uncertain, a little bit unpredictable, a little bit all over the place. Now I'll explain why I think that is. What follows is I'm going to do a whole litany of what I observe to be similarities, and then after that I will get into some of the divergences. So first the similarities are that both of them, they have a, a, a slow sense of of time, and, and not just a slow sense, but also a very flexible sense of the unfolding of time and the tempo and the regularity of the tempo. I would almost say these are both at least partially in free time or in rubato time, and um, which is to say there's no discernible toe-tapping beat to follow. Along the same lines, they're both relatively atonal, as far as I can tell, which means there's no obvious note that they're centered around. There's no obvious key that they're in. They are really free to move chromatically all over the place. We talked about chromaticism a little bit in episode 14 of this show, Chromatic Father Years with Matt Berkey. Um, but all you really need to know if you didn't well, hear that episode is that chromaticism basically is like, screw what palette of colors I got, I'm just gonna use all of the colors. And so that very much falls in line with atonality. Instead of um, using like an organized set of notes, like when something is atonal, you might hear like, like I'm just not even looking at my hands while I'm playing the piano, I'm just kind of picking at random notes and that's sort of a stereotypical, like uh, it's, it's sort of like the stereotypical way that people might make fun of atonal music is just by going like, plunk, 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 but um, both of these pieces have aspects, if not um, are characterized by their atonality. Another thing I will say is, let's see, both of them feature similar instrumentation. Of course, we're still in the orchestra realm. This is a John Williams Star Wars score, but more specifically, there are a lot of woodwinds, and woodwinds seem really, um, they seem really prominent in a way that they're not always. And same with strings, and in a specific way. So what I notice in the strings is that we hear strings in their end ranges and end ranges of notes. So we'll hear very high strings, and I'm about to get out my violin, so if high-pitched stuff bothers you, just it's coming in a second. So we hear violins playing really up high at their upper end range. Like, and then we hear like cellos and, and basses playing really low, playing really low stuff too. I mean, violin doesn't go as low as those instruments, but basically we hear like, um, the, the same thing in, in woodwinds too, by the way, we're hearing like bass clarinets and we're hearing like really low and then we also hear like piccolos. There's not much like moderation in between. We're not hearing much of like, much of those middle things, we're hearing like really the extreme versions of these instruments. 
um, which I think is really interesting. I don't, you know, I don't know what to make of it, but sonically, it kind of creates like a big space in the middle, like a big hole in the middle. Uh, and I think, you know, that probably helps make us feel like there's a sense of space, like a cave. The music is, uh, the instrumentation and, and the frequencies being represented are almost, um, the, almost cave-like in that they're very high and very low. Um, now I'm gonna have to check that on a sp spectrometer or something later, because what if that was just something I made up? But really, the high and low thing is something I noticed. All right, another thing is they both use like harp and celeste, and so it gives that ethereal, plucky instrument sound, and this is pizzicato on the violin, but I definitely was hearing like harps as well and the more um, ethereal plucks. And you could hear it really at the beginning of each of them. Another thing that they both have in common, let me play some examples of those actually. Like what I mean by the ethereal plucky stuff is here's an example from the cave in The Last Jedi. Here. Another example would be just the beginning of the cave. It just starts with like a repeated pluck. Let's see if uh, in the magic tree. that right there the harp yeah so they both have that another thing that they both have in common in and which is really important for how they function in the scene to build up tension and then reveal something or or you know let us come out on the other end of it without so much over direction and feeling the surprise along with the character is the use of swells and drops off drops off drop offs which we also talked about in the episode about transitions, and that episode is called Timpani and Timpani Out, if you wanna review that at some point. Um, basically, the swell is a nice narrative technique, it's a nice musical technique device to draw our attention to something. It's like the roller coaster climbing to the top of the hill and the part where you're like looking down before you go down. Um, let me play you some examples. So first, let's do a swell that we hear in the cave, which is from The Last Jedi. I'm gonna try to make this very clear which examples I'm playing because I, it's so easy to mix them up. <laughs> so, yes, okay. This is an example from the cave in The Last Jedi and you're listening for the swell. So that's you going off the cliff. And now here's an example from the magic tree from The Empire Strikes Back. And again, a swell. That was a more dramatic one. All right, um, we have a lot of things already, but I'm gonna keep adding to them. Another one is a, and they both have these in common, they both use these techniques, glissandi. Glissando, it's spelled G-L-I-S-S-A-N-D-O, and it comes from the French word for glide, or to glide. Basically, what that means is it's a continuous slide, either upward or downward, it doesn't matter. And it sounds something like this. And if you're watching on YouTube, or because this podcast is also posted on YouTube, um, then look at my fingers as I play the violin, because you'll see that I'm not even lifting my fingers, like I'm not sw switching fingers as I switch notes. I'm just, I'm just sliding one finger up the fingerboard. 
So. They can be either long or they could take place in a shorter span of time. So that's a glissando and it's it's a lovely technique and it's a good one if you're going to if you want to learn some violin techniques just to be able to spot them. This is a good bang for your buck one to be able to recognize because glissandos, glissandi, they happen a lot and um yeah, I, th I, th I think you would might enjoy knowing knowing how to spot those. So anytime you hear a slidey thing, glissando. Um, let's see. I will play example. Let me play examples of those. First, the magic tree. So if you were listening to the violins, it went. Now here's an example from the cave. From The Last Jedi. Nope, wrong example. This one, here we go. So listen for the end of this. is very subtle at the end. That's what that was. Glissandi, they both definitely use that. Oh, we're trucking right along. This is good, okay. The next thing, and I, I actually, I love this about this track um, and some other Parts of the Star Wars score too use this too definitely, but here I think it's used so it's used so subtly that it is really well. Let me just tell you what it is. Okay, tone clusters. It sounds delicious, and it is delicious. Tone clusters and minor seconds. Um, basically, it is like smashing a bunch of notes that are right next to each other and I'm playing them all at once. Let me play you some examples and then I'll tell you why I like them. <laughs> Okay, right there at the beginning already. These two notes are playing at the same time. It's okay if you can't hear it. It is very subtle. Three notes, actually, I hear. It's great. First it's these two notes, and then the clarinet joins one half step down. Sounds like a mistake, and it would be in, in some other music, but here the effect that it has, and Stravinsky does this a lot too, the effect that it has is it is confusing, <laughs> and I literally mean like it is throwing the listener off, not letting not letting the answer of what note does this be too simple. It's sort of like a lot of um, what I'm trying. What I'm doing, I'm it's slow to spit this out because I'm trying. I'm trying to not use words like dissonance and and things like that that are definitely 
subject to interpretation because in some cultures this is not dissonant and in some types of music like even in WC and impressionistic music some tone clusters aren't always dissonant but sometimes tone clusters are dissonant put it that way or sometimes they're meant to be dissonant sometimes they're meant to be like confusing and you know it's sort of like if notes are colors instead of just putting up blue a true blue like just a very clear unambiguous blue is sort of like you put Jonah Limbs is presenting like a bunch of shades of blue at the same time and and showing you all of these clashing to some some people just find it nice to have all the shades some people find it you know these notes clashy some people like the complexity in the shades of blue that you're getting so a tone cluster is like that it's like it's vaguely it's like d d d d d d but it's not making a commitment to which note is the defining note of that cluster. So that's why I love tone clusters for each of these scenes. And I think it really, um, I, I think it really adds uh, a musical uh, layer to the quest and to, you know, the wavering, definitely not unwavering, but like the wavering and the searching-ness uh, of both of our hero characters in each of their journeys here. You know, they're searching, they don't have the answer. So they have these clusters of notes and no one of them is standing out and in no one of them is like going to present itself as the key that this is in or like, you know, the main path to follow. Ambiguous on purpose. The last one I will say for similarities is tritone, the use of tritones. Tritones are a bisected octave, and I will explain what I mean by that. Because um, tritones are another cool thing to notice, and some listeners will be more suited to noticing rhythmic things, some will might be better at noticing harmonic things. Some might be better at noticing like textural things like the glissando and, and stuff like that. So if you're someone who you think you can um, pick up on harmonic aspects, then let me explain a tritone. But I'm also going to explain technically what it is too so everyone else can at least intellectually understand what it is. Okay. So first of all, an octave is the size of interval between two notes of the same letter name. Octave, you can tell that the number eight is somewhat involved and it's very simply it is like the space of eight notes. Because in music steps and half steps and you know steps are sort of, they're counted so, and intervals are measured in terms of how many, uh, like how many steps are in between the two notes. And the way I like to think about that is just literally like if you were at a staircase and there's eight steps on the staircase, the space between step one and step six would be six. And so it would be a sixth if you were to name the space, if you were to name the lengths of distances between various stairs. I don't know, sounds kind of fun. So if I ever throw around a term like fourth, I just mean there are four notes from the bottom note to the top note. That's all that means. A fifth, it just means there's five notes from the bottom to the top. An octave just means there's eight notes. Octaves do have a special property to them. And I'm going to bring in a little bit of acoustics here, like physical, like physics, acoustics. <laughs> wow. No, I did not explain that well. Okay. So I'm going to play this note. That note is an A. It's an open A on the violin. 
a little bit out of tune, but just ignore that. So that's an open A string on the violin. The reason we hear a note A, or the reason that is called A, is because that is the name that we have at some point in history decided to call what happens when we hear the result of a string vibrating 440 times per second. So the reason I broke it down like that is because one of them is like a fact, an undisputed fact. This is vibrating 440 times a second, but it's a little out of tune, so it's, you know, not exact, but the cultural part is that we collectively as a, you know, whoever decided, whoever came up with the note names decided that that was going to be called A, and that is universal. That is universal. So A's are the same. It's like we've calibrated basically our colors, you know, that we all call something of something blue or something red. There's a lot of similarities between colors and music. All right. 440 times per second. That's also called 440 hertz. If we were to double that frequency, so from 440 to 880 hertz, it would sound like this. So this is 440. This is 880. If I play them together. You might realize that they sound kind of like the same note. <laughs> and it is. They're both A's. And they're one octave apart. So um, the reason I say that is because octaves are a really a really basic measurement unit in Western classical music. And even though the fact that, you know, there's so much importance placed on it and that we have decided that that is like the marker is, you know, cultural in many ways, there is the fact that if you double a frequency, the next, the note that you get is an octave. So the there is like physically something about octaves that makes them sound the same. And that makes it sound, that makes it valid, like valid in my mind that we call both of those things A. I hope that made sense, but if it didn't, that's okay. It might just be better for you to think about how the notes repeat A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and just know that it's eight, basically eight notes. And so an octave is eight notes apart. Anyway, all of that is just to say a tritone is the note you get when you cut an octave exactly in half. So. I'm gonna walk them closer to each other. This is the note that's in between. So this would be a tritone. Now the tritone is thought of as an unstable interval, at least in Western classical functional harmony. If you hear tritone, it usually means you're going to resolve it either half step up or down, or In music school, I learned that tritones used to be called the devil's interval in the Middle Ages, and apparently it was like banned by the church and stuff. But I've since learned that that actually was probably not true and is just a interesting story that people blew up and taught in music schools for centuries. So if I ever told someone that in the past, I'm sorry, because I don't actually think it's true, and I think everyone just spreads that around, that the devil's interval is a tritone. Um, but the fact that it pa passed off as a possible uh, thing kind of goes to show how tritones have been used in not only media music, like film music, but also, you know, in other concert works for decades, I'd say. Like, 
other than in cases where the tritone resolves, like when I showed you, um, to sit on a tritone, the point is it's unstable, it's used in spooky contexts, it's used in horror stuff, um, and it's used in both of these tracks. <laughs> That was a very long way of explaining that, but I hope you learned something um, and that it wasn't too boring. So yes, they both use tritones a ton, a ton. Let me see if I can find an example. There are so many, I didn't even write down an example. Okay, this is the cave. Right there, that's a tritone. From F natural to B natural. It's really everywhere. It would, it would uh, almost be, not pointless, but just take my word for it. It happens everywhere and um, I'm gonna move on because I spent a lot of time on tritones. <laughs> I like tritones for the record. Because I wanna talk about differences now. A lot of these differences are like similarities, but the execution of them is slightly different in a way that I find at least a little bit meaningful in my interpretation of both of their journeys. So first and foremost, I will say, again, on a big grand scale, Ray's music is in general more sparse than Luke's music on Dagobah. So I didn't play the full tracks, but let me play a moment in Ray's, the cave, where we get a solo woodwind. So this is gonna be kind of soft because it's just like solo woodwinds, just a solo instrument, one person playing. So this, um, this especially comes into play when she's talking with Kylo Ren, which I know isn't technically part of her cave scene, but I'll get sort of into it in a bit why I think the music and the sound sort of, they sort of um, blend at least my perception of where the cave scene ends. <laughs> um, in last episode, the guest Takeo brought in the concept or brought in the idea that The Last Jedi and the in these scenes are almost Brechtian in nature. And Bertold Brecht, playwright, um, was sort of known for a style called epic theater. And that was sort of a you know, techniques to encourage the audience to suspend their disbelief or at least, actually to not suspend their disbelief, but to, what does Wikipedia say? To force them to see their world as it is. And that was done through like estrangement techniques and, and things that evoked alienation. And we were talking last episode about all the space and silence and just sort of alienation in The Last Jedi and in Ray's journey. And I think the little woodwind solo and just the sparseness of her music in this really, in this really terrifying, dark passage of her life, um, sort of fits with that in a way. I'll play a little bit from the magic tree again so you can hear how much fuller it is. Tritone. All right. The next thing I'll say is the use of tremolo. So they both use tremolos. And what a tremolo is, I will demonstrate it, is a trembling effect, which on a bowed string instrument is evoked by like literally moving the bow back and forth really quickly so that it repeats the same note like many, many times. So.
that, that. So we hear them a lot in Magic Tree. Um, and it's a very, it's, it, gives, it gives a frenetic feeling. It um, is very, it's uh, used to build tension in many cases. Um, like we do hear it in the big swell, which I've played a few times, so I won't play it again, but sort of this stuff. All that trembling. You may have already heard the term tremolo before, so now I'm gonna give you a different layer of tremolo, and this is the type of tremolo that I hear in the cave for Ray's scene in The Last Jedi measured tremolo. We get this right here. Before I tell you what it is, I'm just gonna play the clip for you and I wanna know if you can hear the difference. So they're pretty similar. They're both like trembly. They're both like really fast repeating notes evoked by moving the bow back and forth really fast. But the measured tremolo is more rhythmic. There's more of a regularity to it. It's measured, which is why it's called a measured tremolo. And when composers, um, you know, intend for there to be a regular tremolo and a measured tremolo, they are different things, and in an orchestra, if I were playing in an orchestra and I saw in the music a tremolo was written and I wasn't exactly sure which one they wanted, I would definitely ask to clarify because it can, it can make a big difference. Is a measured tremolo, and if I were to do that as a regular tremolo, it would be more like... Subtle. I'm curious if that um, if you were able to hear that. Let me know. Let me know. Uh, tweet at me or something. But the measuredness is significant for me, and I think I like it for Ray because um, she's in this situation where she's getting like doubles, triples, quadruples, like tons of herself, like reflections, mirror images, and the measured tremolo, like. The fact that the tremolos are measured sort of visually lines up with how many rays are in quick succession. It's a little bit more finite than just putting a tremolo effect because when it's a, an effect, it's almost like, uh, it's almost lost because it doesn't feel as deliberate. But if you watch this scene again, you'll notice that the tremolos really start when we get start getting the ray reflections. And um, I just, I love that moment. Let's see, what is another thing? We're almost done here, I promise. Uh, oh, in the magic tree, you, you already heard it in the clips that I played, but we get thematic, we get more Luke thematic recall. We get do, 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 on his way into the cave. And this is after Luke, uh, Yoda says, you don't need your weapons and he, <laughs> takes them anyway. We get Luke's regular theme. However, when we have the big reveal, Well, that was Luke going into the cave. That wasn't the big reveal. What we get, and I'll just play it on the piano. That's Luke's minor theme. This is when we see his face. He sees his face in Vader's mask. It's like his heroic theme has been knocked down a notch, knocked down a level. There's a little bit of a grim aspect to it. 
But it is significant that his theme accompanies him in this journey and is part of the climax of his discovery. On the other hand, in Ray's mirror cave scene, the moment where she touches the mirror and sees herself, we don't hear anything at all. Instead, we hear the distinct vacuuming out of sound, like we've heard several times in this film. The music sort of climaxes up and then drops out. It's lonely. So we do hear a high sustained B. And then if you remember when we talked about the force Skyping and the reverse reverb and the sort of like that is what we get. So sound design wise, in Luke's scene, we have wind, we have R2 beeps, we have forest animals, lightsaber clashings. When, she, when he's fighting his father in the vision, we have the Vader mask sounds. Um, and in general, his sounds reflect his external and possibly internal environments. In Ray's, we get really detailed sound work. Like the sound design in Ray's scene is really front and center. Like we get the echoes, we get the water, um, we get the amplified sounds of Ray's really minute movements, like every time she flips her hand or like snaps and things like that. The sounds that reflect her environment and her emotions and her future and past. I pulled up some interviews from the sound people who worked on this film to get their perspective. And so I'll, I'll read you a little bit of what, you know, the people who actually worked on it said about the sound in Ray's scene. So Ren Kleiss, the sound designer, said, a lot of the sounds in that scene were natural ones. So recordings captured underwater, the sound of ocean, kelp, and ice. Um, and then they used contact, which is a Native Instruments sampler. Um, we blah, blah, blah. When she snaps her finger, the snap sound was done editorially with just a finger snap that we lined up to picture. So that was done afterward. And then they panned it, moved it, reverberated it, reverbed it. Uh, they used a similar technique to the force connection dialogue, which I think is interesting because we do get Kylo on the way out. And then, um, oh, apparently they actually had more sounds in that scene that Ryan Johnson ended up taking out at the last second. So when Ray clenches her fist, and there's like a repeating sound for, for what they had moving around, the, uh, moving around, they ended up, um, he says, we ended up getting rid of a few things per Ryan's request just to open it up. But there are lots of different textures in there. I think that's interesting. And keeping in mind what we talked about in the music with the frequencies and having uh, really high strings and really low strings, but not much occupying the middle, like there really is a vacuous space in the middle. Um, like lots of pockets of space in the sound world of Ray's scene. Um, does he say anything else? He says some stuff later. So, oh yeah, lastly, let's see, let's see. Oh, no, the cave, the cave is next. Um, yeah, the last thing I'll say about that really is um, through the voiceover reflection that we get, which is like, we're in there with Ray, and then she says, like, I should have been whatever. Uh, we both jump forward into the present because this is the voiceover from when she's talking to Kylo Ren. So we're simultaneously jumping forward and then also, in a way, jumping backward because we're hearing her future voice, and so it makes us reinterpret the scene that we're in as the past. It's really, uh, it's a really interesting time warp that is instigated purely by the sound. So remember, voiceover is absolutely part of the sound environment too. Um, and the bookends of, this, of these two scenes, very long list, okay. Um, but this sums up, this sums up my, the arguments that I've been making is in Luke's Dagobah scene, when he goes in, Yoda is there. When he goes out, Yoda is there. Yoda is there guiding him into the scene. 
After a training session, he's the one that says, in you must go. R2's waiting too. Luke's experience feels pretty supported, even though he goes in there alone. He really has like a guided, a much more guided psychedelic experience, I could say. Ray's experience, on the other hand, feels, it feels so much more lonely. She goes into it alone. She falls into the hole, the hole that she's not supposed to go in, you know? Luke is certainly not like, one day you should go into this, you should go into the dark cave and explore it. She goes into it unsupported, <laughs> and she's alone when she falls in. She's alone in there. She doesn't even see her parents in the reflection, just herself. She's just her with her multiple rays. And on the way out, who is there? Not her mentor. On the way out, she is either alone or she goes straight to talking to Kylo. So interpret that how you will, but I think it's I think it's um a really important divergence between their two their two scenes. All right. Almost done with this episode. The last things I'll say is uh, just to recap what happens in these minutes. Um, as Luke runs out in the rain to stop Kylo and Ray, we hear There we go. That was very approximate. But keep in mind the first four notes. I'll talk about this later at some point, but those four notes are a, a recurring motif. Um, classical musicians out there might recognize it as the DSCH motif. DSCH, which is... Uh, initials, it's, it's like a motto, it's um, a cryptogram for Dmitry Shostakovich's name and also the notes that uh, <laughs> uh, made up his motto. But don't worry about that, pretend I didn't say that, um, because it's not, I don't think it's important, but those four notes lend themselves to meandering, ominous uh, vibes like this. So, and then as Kylo and Ray are moving their hands toward each other, we hear a meandering line that I think we've heard several times before. You may or may not recognize it, but I'll play it regardless. Did I write it down? That's definitely not it. Um, uh, what am I talking about? With all this chromaticism, it's like easy to it's easy to uh, get confused. Okay, here's what it is. Their hands are approaching. ends on a question, and then as their hands touch, we get the force. It's a very tender moment, very tender moment. And then we know what happens when uh, Luke comes crashing in. So, when asked what the trickiest scene to mix in The Last Jedi was in terms of effects, the mixing effects and Foley artist Michael Semenik said, the moment Kylo Ren and Rey touch hands via the force connection was the toughest part. So the end of this five minute chunk, basically. Um, he says, we were cutting back and forth from her place to Kylo's place. We were hearing her campfire and her rain is a very delicate balance between that and the music. We could have had the rain really loud and the music blasting, but Ryan wanted the rain and fire to peel away as their hands were getting closer. So these are small details that I didn't even notice until reading this. It was so quiet, and when they did touch, there was just a bit of a low-end thump. I love that thump. If you know what I mean by that thump, 
then you might know exactly what I'm talking about. And if not, I highly recommend going back to listen to that because it's such a, it's such a delicate detail that they put in there that makes the moment of impact of quote unquote impact when they touch fingertips so much more powerful. Like if you think that of the job of a sound designer or something, like how do you make the moment where two fingertips touch feel like something is just falling inside of you? Like a, like how do you make it feel powerful, like in the seat of your soul? Well, the low end thump is what they settled on. Having a big sound there didn't have the intimacy that the scene demanded. It, or just um, It can be so hard to get the balance right to where the audience is feeling the same thing as the characters. The audience is going, no, 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 blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's all I have to say about that. I threw a lot of stuff at you today. And so props if you got through this episode or, um, or if you have things to add to what I'm saying. Um, but if not, truly, these things will come up again. And I look forward to having uh, more discussion about this when I get to The Empire Strikes Back, whenever I do that season. So um, yeah, consider this a trial run for that for that future episode. Because I think it's really um, not only important to think about the role that music is playing in a scene while we're in the scene, I think it can also be, especially in impactful moments like this where there's a lot of thematic crossover and when there's obviously like generational repetition and um, heroes following the same journey, I think it can be interesting to look at the sound in a more vertical way. Um, you know, sort of like one might do with the cinematography in those scenes or, or other aspects. Um, the force theme and Ray's theme are what we hear in these five minutes and the soundtrack it corresponds to is number 12 on the soundtrack, The Cave. The similarities that we went over were things like atonality, free time, tritones, instrumentation choices with the extremes of the high strings and low strings, swells, glissando, glissandi, and some of the differences were in the tremolos versus the measured tremolos, and the moments of solo versus the not so sparse, the a little bit more denseness of Luke's experience. Always remember, this is a little note from me, um, always remember that just because two pieces of music have similarities, it does not always mean that there's a big secret or a terribly deep intention behind it. Um, sometimes there is no doubt. There are a few associations that John Williams has gone on the record confirming, but in many times, these things can just be a coincidence or a natural byproduct of a composer or an era or a genre. Like, I wouldn't draw too much connection between two 80s pop songs using a Yamaha DX7 synth. I'll put it that way. Um, and if you're interested in more of these vertical comparisons, do let me know. Also, I highly recommend checking out the work of Frank Lehman, who I've mentioned several times on this podcast. He maintains a comprehensive Star Wars thematic catalog at franklehman.com slash Star Wars. I don't know him personally, but I want to know him. And even if you don't read music, I think there are some great descriptions in there. And at the end, there are some tables, charts, and a graph tabulating um, like number of cues per film and some other, and some other things if you want to see broader trends. Uh, that is all I have for today. A little bit of a marathon. Listeners, I'd love to know what you think. I'm active on Twitter at Star Wars Museman or at Chris Anthony Tan. You can also shoot me an email at podcast at Star Wars Music Minute.com. If you have an in depth question about something related to Star Wars music or sound, and uh, if you're watching Bad Batch animated series, I do music commentary on YouTube at the Star Wars Music Minute channel there. Uh, some friends join me, including a former guest of the show, James Waterman. Um, there's a little bit of guess the, guess the tune or guess the part that this thing I'm playing shows up in there. Um, so a little, little plug for that. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for your attention and 
your enthusiasm about the music and sound of Star Wars. I will see you next week on Star Wars Music Minute.